The topic uh, of the panel is the Nordic welfare stage in changing Europe, divergences and similarities. We will discuss in line with the overall conference theme towards resilient uh, Nordic welfare state, challenges, responses and consequences. We will talk about the key characteristics of the Nordic welfare state, challenges it is facing, as well as how well the countries have responded to these challenges and furthermore, how the future looks like. This uh, conference is also a kickoff for the Nordic Welfare Research Network, and thereby we will discuss the whereabouts of this co co collaboration. We have four panelists. Jon Quist, a professor from uh, Roskilde University, Denmark. Jon has over the years, over the decades, uh, studied the Nordic welfare state and has edited a number of uh, volumes on the Nordic welfare model and uh, was one of the establishing fathers of the European Social Policy Analysis Network. Nice to have you here, Jon. Next to Jon, we are delighted to have Gutni uh, Björk Eidel, uh, professor from the uh, University of Iceland. She is also an expert on the Nordic welfare state and has published widely on the Nordic family policies and has written on the experiences of the Iceland before and after the harsh economic crisis. Next to Gunni, we have Rune Halvarsen, Associate Professor from Oslo Metro Metropolitan University. Rune's main interests are European and comparative welfare policy, social citizenship, and citizenship movements. His recent research projects have focused on active citizenship, poverty, disability, and youth transitions. And he has led a number of cross-national projects funded by the Nordic Council. Delighted to have you here, Rune. And then uh, Professor Kenneth Nelson uh, from University of Stockholm, where he's currently a head of the social policy unit at the Swedish Institute for Social Research, SOFI. Uh, Kenneth's uh, research focuses on the causes and consequences of the welfare state and social policy, often in comparative perspective. He has worked as an independent expert uh, for various national and international uh, government agencies and organizations. We are happy to have you here, Kenneth. We have four distinguished scholars who have wide knowledge on the, uh, on the Nordic welfare state and who have been also very actively uh, involved in cross-national uh, networks and cross-national research projects. I'm really looking forward to this uh, panel discussion and our talk. For the audience, we have also the possibility to offer you to take actively part in our discussions. Uh, those of, who, those of uh, you who have downloaded the conference app, you... <laughs> Don't. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will take this, this way. Okay. Those of you who have downloaded the conference app, you find there are new, two uh, new icons. One with the live queue uh, at A, through which you can send questions or comments, and they will appear here. And somebody from the audience, most likely Paula, will point to me that, okay, there's the questions and comments we should uh, look at. 
Then there is another icon uh, called Live Poll app. And uh, you should open your uh, app and then open the Live Poll uh, icon, which you see there, and follow the simple instructions. At some point, it is, uh, um, you should enter a PIN a number there. You should ask it. Four, four, three, three. And you should have a green uh, light indicating that everything is properly connected. So the PIN number or code is 4433. Three. And we have prepared uh, three uh, questions for the audience. And hopefully uh, the technique works. We are brave because this is the test version of the app but thought that it will offer a wonderful opportunity for interactive discussion. Wonderful. And those of you, uh, of you who are active on, a, in, uh, on a Twitter, remember to use the hashtag Nordic Espanet when you are tweeting from the conference or from this, this uh, panel session. Okay. Let's start, dear colleagues. The Nordic uh, welfare states continue to attract great interest all over the world, as we heard yesterday several times. But we know also that there is uh, quite a lot of questioning whether there is actual, uh, whether there is an actual Nordic model. Are the Nordic, uh, Nordic welfare states somehow distinct from the other European countries or from the other affluent countries? So, what is your opinion? What would you say? Is there a Nordic model? And what are the characters that distinguish the Nordic countries from the other countries? And I'm so happy that Jon decided to sit here in the first seat, <laughs> because I heard yesterday, last week uh, Jon uh, giving a lecture in Copenhagen where he was talking about the Nordic model. Okay. <laughs> I don't think it's uh, the place to start lecturing anybody about the Nordic model in this audience. Uh, so. Uh, Perhaps just to recap, you know, if we compare ourselves to how the situation looks like in other countries, I think one of the uh, distinct traits is the uh, emphasis we put on uh, securing that everybody has autonomy, that they are able to realize uh, their lives with regard to forming families, getting education, uh, and uh, getting work and being in good health. So in these different domains of life, I think that uh, our welfare states have a bigger role compared to that in other countries. So it is the legitimacy uh, of the state in intervening in people's uh, life conditions in order to maximize the realization of the human potential. I think that is the, the key part of the Nordic welfare model. Uh, it's a key part of the Nordic welfare model that we maybe forget in our day-to-day -day discussions about welfare reforms and what have you, where this may not be the center stage of the discussions, but we can come back to, to the politics of welfare reform later on. But I think securing human potential and securing the autonomy of people is, is like the main uh, trait of the Nordic uh, welfare model, if you're going to put down to one feature, which is not fair. And if you look at how we do it, it's mainly through services. Mm. So I know that we have a lot of people here who are studying social security and minimum income schemes, uh, and that's very good. But other countries have invented these schemes too. Uh, where we stand apart is very much on the uh, emphasis uh, we have on social services, family policies, labor market policies, health and education uh, programs. Uh, that's where we have built up a big sector that is, is not parallel uh, to the same extent in other countries. Thank you. And you, Gunny. Yeah. Uh, maybe to add up on that, I think we might want to remember the gender perspective because we've been in three sessions talking about the paid parental leave 
And that's surely something that distinguishes us from the, the rest of the European countries. And the further we go away from our region, the more clear our model becomes. And I think also we should keep in mind the children, because our child policies, uh, Norway being the forerunner and the other countries leading uh, in child protection, in child, children's rights and services for children. So we are maybe more special than we kind of tend to remember when we are discussing the differences between our five countries in our sessions. So I think we, we should keep these two issues also in mind. And now I'm looking at one of the few housing scholars in the room. Maybe we need to keep that also in, in mind, that our housing systems are, are a little bit special. And we don't discuss that often enough. Thank you. Very, very good points. Rune, what are your thoughts? So, um, I think one uh, dimension that has been uh, often missing in the discussions about the, uh, the Nordic model is the uh, differences in uh, uh, what we sometimes refer to as uh, social regulation policies, the uh, employment protection, the non-discrimination regulations, the uh, 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 policies that are aiming to address uh, employers and uh, also the, the providers of a certain the behavior uh, of uh, providers of uh, uh, goods and services. So um, I think that's also a dimension that sometimes complicates and make you know, the, the questions a bit and makes the picture more uh, mixed than is sometimes uh, in, in reflected in discussion about whether it does exist a Nordic model. And I, you find that partly in the discussion about flex security uh, and how Denmark perhaps in particular distinguishes itself from the, perhaps especially the other Scandinavian, but also the other Nordic countries uh, more, more generally. So I think that's uh, something that could have been uh, and needs more, more attention. And then uh, a second uh, dimensional factor is that is frequently claimed that uh, that universalism is a key characteristic uh, of the, the the Nordic model, but that seems to be at least the feature feature that is uh, challenged by uh, and uh, under pressure in 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 several uh, of the Nordic countries. Thank you. Kenneth, I know you yeah. have been traveling around the world and telling about the Nordic model. What do you tell your audience in Brazil, for example? Yeah, I'm, 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 I tend to, to develop a more and more pessimistic approach for every year. Uh, <laughs> that happens when you get older? Yeah, uh, but I'm also sort of a little bit puzzled, because every time when you look at those uh, EU rankings, when we look at outcomes in terms of labor force participation, poverty, inequality, and stuff like that, the Nordic countries always perform good, and we're top of the league. But on the other hand, when, when at least when I look at the social policies as such, I see quite clear tendencies that the Nordic countries are moving apart. Uh, Sweden is going further and further down to the bottom. <laughs> we have one of the worst old age pension systems in, 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 in the rich countries, among the rich countries. Uh, social assistance is becoming less generous. Uh, unemployment insurance, uh, 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 I think last estimate was that among the unemployed in Sweden, uh, only about 40% qualify for an earnings-related benefit. So, so, and we see this sort of a little bit of dismounting of the welfare state. I think we can see in Finland as well, clear tendencies. We don't see it in Norway, or at least I don't see it in Norway when I look at the data that I have. Uh, and Denmark, I'm a little bit, a little bit uncertain about basically because you always have been a little bit of an outlier in the Nordic context. Uh, uh, 
And then we have we have the you know the the service sector where we're at least Sweden we have a lot of privatization and semi privatization going on and stuff like that. So so I, I to some extent agree with Rune that that there are clear tendencies that at least some of the Nordic countries are, are moving away from this traditional social democratic universal uh, welfare state. But on the other hand, when we look at the outcomes, we are still performing good. And I'm, I sometimes wonder why we perform so good when the, when the policies uh, uh, are, are getting worse. Uh, so 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 um, yeah. So I'm 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 a bit skeptical whether we can talk about the Nordic model or not. Maybe maybe we can talk about the Nordic model in terms of outcomes. I'm I'm more skeptical talking about it in terms of the social policies as such. Thank you. Would some of you like to re reflect? The, maybe just to mention, we, we already see some changes in the outcomes, for example, in child poverty in Sweden, so something is happening. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, we see we see it also among, among the elderly. Um, we did a report for, for the World Bank recently, and we see that, that uh, uh, relative poverty is increasing among the elderly, and elderly incomes are Incomes among the elderly are now more unequal than incomes in the working age population. So inequalities are reinforced in old age. So a lot of things happen. But on the other hand, when we look at child poverty, when we look at the absolute levels and compare the Nordic countries to, to the rest of Europe, we, 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 we still perform good, although we're not as good as we used to be. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I found this really interesting that when you're looking at sort of the wider outcomes, not only child poverty, but more widely child well-being, the results are such what you said, Kenneth, that fin uh, Finland, of course, always stands out that all the Nordic countries are among the best countries in the world in this well-being aspects. Okay, let's be brave and ask from the audience, we start our first uh, Paul, can I put it on now, Paul? Which is the best Nordic country? I yeah. think there's only <laughs> there's only one box for Sweden. I think in the end, <laughs> it's not working yet. Okay, okay. But the question is, you can see it in your app when you go there. The live poll. Uh, is the Nordic uh, welfare model uh, still a super model? Super model. <laughs> That's how it was called two years ago. In some, uh, it was a, uh, a newspaper called The Economist, not The Newsweek. That's how the title went. left. Okay. Ten minutes, and sorry, ten seconds. And you can, of course, think about the answer to this question. Is the Nordic welfare model still a supermodel? Based on the answers you get, we get from the audience. And Paula will be our results secretary. <laughs> No, that is so old fashioned. <laughs> okay. Six. Six. So could we sort of conclude that the majority of those who responded and used the modern app still think that the, uh, the modic welfare model is a, a supermodel? Were you surprised by the results? In a way, no, don't take into account the response rate. <laughs> <laughs> in a way, I was, because in uh, well, one thing is, if you look at the outcomes, you 
could perhaps argue along those lines, but I'm not so convinced that people in non-Nordic countries would say that this model is applicable or possible to adopt elsewhere with their different institutional configurations. So, um, so it's in that way, I think it's a bit perhaps obvious stated to mm. claim it to be a supermodel because it's you have to take into account that this the velvet mix is very different and the uh, path dependencies and institutional settings are quite different elsewhere in Europe and the rest of the world, of course. Yeah, you mentioned uh, here it was John Nocken that the outcomes are good, but the uh, policies are not doing so well. Uh, the measures that are used or are reformed in, in Nordic countries. So if you think about the sort of the recent uh, development and the ongoing discussions and policy reforms in your country, could you share uh, your sort of uh, quick analysis of the current state? And, and do you see the core values of the model, Nordic welfare model, sort of uh, in contradiction, at risk somehow? Should we now start with Kenneth? <coughs> okay, yeah. The, at the moment in Sweden, I, or at least the way I read the newspapers is that there, there is not, there is no major discussion about welfare or social security, I think, at the moment in Sweden. Uh, but there are some underlying issues uh, uh, which probably will be brought on the table and, and obviously one, one such issue is, is um, uh, privatization, of course, in schools and uh, uh, in, um, in healthcare. Uh, another issue is, of course, uh, old age pensions, uh, um, which I think should be, be... There have been some investigations uh, on it, but I, I think that what, what we really need to, to, to discuss much more is the, the occupational pillar in the, in the pension system and what we should do with those 10% that are not in a collective agreements uh, because that's, that's, those are the ones who, who will fall in, in poverty in old age. Uh, but there is also a problem in Sweden, as you probably know all of you, is that, that the government is quite weak. Uh, the previous government was very weak, this government is even weaker. So I don't think that we can expect any major changes because it's almost impossible to to take any major changes in terms of welfare uh, through the parliament at the moment. Okay, thanks. Really. So I think um, one aspect that perhaps uh, that concerns me is that Traditionally, the Nordic welfare model has been based on rather collaborative and industrial relations uh, in, with uh, agreements between the social partners and the government, and also with a tradition for strong involvement of civil society organizations to receive, reach consensus, um, and with uh, declining trade union density and um, in some countries, you also see declining uh, financial support to civil society organizations or in, even involvement of them in the deliberation of uh, uh, social policies. Um, I think there's a risk that the, 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 the trust in the government and the overall glue in, in the system uh, might be uh, sort of under, under pressure here. Um, so uh, that might cause larger conflicts around social policy issues than we have been been used to in in, in the Nordic country, countries. Thank you. Yeah. I c I could also then add that we lost trust in politics and parliament during crisis. And it's about 12% the trust to parliament right now. 
So it hasn't been restored. So you could say that even though we have recovered from a crisis economically, the trust crisis is still ongoing. And this is, of course, very serious and unusual in the Nordic context. But otherwise, there's not much new from the, the welfare system. Nothing is happening, absolutely nothing. It's still standing. We, we still drive towards the Nordic model. And the only thing that changes is actually a reinforcement of the Nordic model in, in terms of uh, child policies. We have a strong social minister who has put children first, and he has even changed the name of the ministry to Ministry of Children and Social Affairs. So he just a few days ago declared that he wants to eliminate children's poverty. So we are, we are on the move in that sense, but otherwise we're mainly restoring what we had to cut during the crisis years. So that's the situation there. Thank you. So we are sharing uh, the troubles we have <laughs> nationally. <laughs> so uh, in Denmark, as you may know, we have a coalition government uh, led by a, a liberal conservative type of uh, a party. Um, and they have uh, reduced uh, benefits that goes to child families, uh, especially if these child families have been living abroad for a number of years. So at the moment, we are having a social safety net uh, that is like this. And then if you have been living abroad for a number of years, it will be a lower safety net. So we are operating with a two-track system or safety nets at different levels uh, depending on uh, who you are. So that is definitely a, a path departure, I would say, from the Nordic uh, model. Uh, however, if we have a change of government, there's an election coming up the 17th of June at the latest, then these policy measures will be abolished by the incoming social democratic-led coalition government. So what we are seeing is a battle forth and back uh, on these uh, benefits, minimum income benefits that are uh, going to child families, uh, mostly from uh, an, an ethnic uh, minority uh, background. Uh, so the social democrats and, and the other parties uh, on the left wing uh, they call them poverty benefits, not meaning that they help you out of poverty, but giving you poverty instead. So that's a very direct uh, part, uh, battle uh, between uh, left and right. Uh, then I think uh, uh, on a even, I don't know if it's more pessimistic, but another pessimistic note is that we are, uh, of course, having an aging population, which means a lot of the professionals in the welfare sector are now retiring uh, at the same time as we are seeing the uh, need for uh, care increasing, not just uh, health care and uh, long-term care, but also in psychiatry and in a lot of other institutions. So we have fewer uh, heads and hands to take care of bigger needs. Uh, that is a, a problem that I think is, is really uh, troublesome. Uh, the good thing, if there is a good thing, <laughs> then I think it is that uh, things are going really bad also outside of Scandinavia. <laughs> So I think it helps people mobilize, uh, and we're seeing that there are parties on the, probably on the left, the trade unions, for example, that are calling for a fight against inequality. So suddenly inequality is appearing on the political agenda much more uh, than previously. And, uh, and here, of course, we have a special uh, justification in the Nordic countries to come in and say, how can we actually fight inequality and then be more conscious about that? So uh, uh, it's dark tunnel, but I see some lights here and there. Good. Thank you. So there is a sort of a, a bit different thing, trends going on in your country. There's some good uh, positive development, what you see, but perhaps more of sort of a worrying um, development. We have one question from the audience, which I will now read to you, since some of you cannot see it. If the Nordic welfare states are now going downhill, when was the peak time for each of them, and what caused uh, the slide towards the bottom? This is the book project. <laughs> it's the book, book project. Oh. Yeah, okay, I can start. Or sh it should we, or was it to the audience? Or to, to, that, that's uh, the question from the audience, wasn't it? From the audience. Ah, well, uh, uh, yeah, it's a it's a book project, but very short uh, for the Swedish case. I would say the the peak was uh, early 1990, 
<laughs> and then uh, from 1991 and onwards, it's just downhill. Now, the, we, we had obviously the, we had the crisis in the early 1990s, uh, uh, where, where a few things were, were changed in, in social policy. Uh, but then we sort of, uh, uh, sort of uh, uh, took back those changes and improved policies again. But then we also had eight years of uh, probably the most neoliberal government in Europe at the time, which uh, were also a very, very clever uh, uh, government. And they did some changes, uh, privatized the, the, the service sector, uh, uh, they uh, made it more difficult for people to, to get access to unemployment benefits and so forth. And then we had the, the big, also the big pension reform. And, and so, so I would say that, that, that there are, are sort of two downward trends, the one in the early 1990s and then during the eight years of, of neoliberal politics. But 1990 was a good year. Okay. <laughs> Do you, in the other Nordic countries, do you find sort of a similar time curve? No, I, I would say that Iceland peaked in 1946, because then we made the best social security legislation in the world. <laughs> but since then, we, are, we have been struggling with reaching the other countries, so yeah, we're still peaking, maybe. Well, yeah, I, I, I I think it's probably uh, more or less the same for Norway as for, for Sweden, that the uh, late 1980s, early 1990s were perhaps uh, uh, better uh, or state of affairs for the, uh, for, for the Nordic uh, welfare model. And then it has been under pressure for, for, for several reasons. One, um, obviously, the uh, uh, business title with the, uh, and the Nordic countries have had uh, been differently uh, exposed to the uh, fin uh, financial crisis and the uh, recession in the aftermath of the, uh, of the crisis, but also earlier we know that the Nordic countries have uh, had quite different levels of uh, unemployment, with high unemployment rates in Denmark and, and Finland than in Norway for during some uh, time spells. So um, that has probably also contributed to slightly different uh, trajectories, trajectories in the in the Nordic countries. But then, of course, you have had the uh, uh, experience of increasing global interdependencies and um, the way perceived need to reform the systems and make the uh, systems more sustainable. Um, that, uh, with demographic aging, as uh, you mentioned earlier, uh, also as an uh, other dimension that's significantly contributing to, to as a driving uh, force behind the, the reforms. Um, yes. Great. I'm not going to say that the situation 30 years ago was better than it is today. Great. <laughs> <laughs> I think that's not the case for very many groups in society. I think that for a lot of groups, they're much better off today than they were 30 years ago. Uh, this goes for mentally ill, this goes for elderly, it goes for a lot of uh, groups, so, and homeless, and uh, you know, for a lot of groups. It's not to say that we're living in a rosy world now. I think that we still have problems. I still think that you know, people with mental illness, for example, are not uh, seen to the same extent as people with physical uh, incapacities. So I think that we still have a long way to go, and I think that perhaps we should not th look uh, to uh, other countries only for seeing if they have an alternative that we would like. I don't think that's the case, actually. And I think that's one of the rationales for having conferences like this, is that we learn more from one another about what has been uh, going on that is, is working uh, well. So, uh, so yes, uh, the, the, the world is not going too well in the Nordic countries in some areas, uh, uh, but I think we know where, where these areas are, and I think we also know how to fix those problems. So uh, I think that's what we should do. Can I just uh, yes. add to uh, yeah, Tom's uh, comment that, yes, I agree, uh, 
that we need uh, perhaps a more differentiated picture uh, here. Um, um, social inequalities, we know at least in Norway, are higher um, today than they used to be in the 1980s, 1990s. Uh, but for so certain population groups or citizens groups, I agree that the situation are, has become uh, better. That I think that's this fair to say, for instance, for, for, for women's position in the labor market, for women's independence, financial independence, independence, for instance, has become uh, in, uh, improved. Um, and also the, the social movements uh, on ethnicity, on LGBT, uh, on, um, issues, uh, on the disability movement and so on have, have contributed to improve the living conditions and the well-being of for those uh, for those groups um, so um, to answer uh, properly not this big question I think we in, in addition to a focus on class we also need a gender perspective but also focus or more generally also on intersectionality mm -hmm. Yeah, well, well, I, to some extent, I agree with with you. So, the, the poor people are getting richer. That that that's for sure. In in Nordic countries, the problem is that the rest of the society is is, is getting even richer, more richer. So so the inequalities are increasing, like like Rune said. And obviously, from a sociological perspective, that that's very problematic, and it has consequences in terms of trust. In terms of conflicts, in terms of the possibility to mobilize across, you know, interest groups and stuff like that. So, 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 so I think that that that's quite worrying, and and we we can also see it in health, for example, when we look at absolute health in terms of looking at how healthy the Swedish and the Norwegian population is. Uh, we are among the most healthiest in, in the world. The strange thing is that when we look at inequalities in health, health we perform exactly as other countries. So, so from that perspective, we, one could say that that well, it, it's good that the poor are getting richer. It's good that we are a healthy population. But there is some fundamentally wrong when inequalities are increasing. And I think that the, the consequences of increased inequality. It, it can be quite quite severe in the future because the consequences are, are probably long term. Yeah. Go ahead, shortly. We yeah, have just, several questions. Okay, sorry. Hopefully, there are questions and not <laughs> yes, so, the titles of the book. <laughs> yeah, so I, I, I agree with Kenneth that the poor has become richer, but they're still relatively poor. That's true, but I think it does matter for your health, for example, whether you are. Relatively healthier than you were previously, even though that you are still suffering from inequalities in, in health. Um, another thing is that I think what we should remember is what we have learned. I think for many years is that it's not only static pictures we should look at how well-being is. It's more dynamic pictures. It is whether people are caught in adverse situations with regard to their health or their economic situation or what have you, or whether they are in a position where they're moving from one stage to another stage to a better health or to a more stable position in the labor market. So having these more dynamic understandings about how the labor market and families and what have you it works, I think, is one of the contributions we should make as a social researchers to uh, the knowledge pool out there. What do the others think about of this uh, Jon's success and that we should have more as a dynamic approach? Most well, well, no, no, I, 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 I totally agree. Of course, it 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 it, it may not it's be so problematic if 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 you know you 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 end up in poverty or something like that during a, a short phase of your life course, compared to a situation when 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 you you are poor in each of those phases. So 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 obviously to to look at. Out and inequalities and well-being, like from a more dynamic life course perspective, is, is of course important. Just adding to the picture, I mean, if, if we think in historical terms, we also have the new challenges mm. due to disasters that we were discussing in a workshop earlier. We have the ecological challenges, and I mean, this will create huge 
task for the welfare state. And we are not really maybe addressing it enough. So I, I would, I, th I think 1990s or 46 might have been easier <laughs> than today if we think in dynamic terms. That's a good point. We are living in a more complex society and world where the issues are more global. We have a question, two questions from the audience. We take them uh, now. Uh, if individual autonomy via the state is defining the Nordic trade, then we'll <laughs> jump somewhere. <laughs> then what policies should be pursued or strengthened in the future? So, sort of the future-orientated questions. Um, investments in human capital, I would say. Uh, in the end, social protection is only, you know, it, it's like you, you, take, you take a pill for a disease. You know, so 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 the, I think that the only way forward actually is is by investing in, in in people, investing in human capital, so they do not need to rely on welfare and social protection. Yeah. But I suppose the the ultimate uh, test is to what extent people have actually the resources, but also the the freedom to to live the life they want uh, have and have reasons to live on for themselves line with at least if we follow the reasoning behind a capability approach to uh, social policy for instance um, the idea in the capability approach is not only to what extent there are people have a, have access to the same types of resources but the other people actually given their particular situation and needs are able to make use of those resources to pursue their life goals and um, they also are involved in in making uh, the, the final decisions about uh, what kind of services they need uh, and in the and if they are consulted and opinions are given importance or weight in in the implementation of the um, investments in human capital as you mentioned. Mm -hmm. Socialist investment, your answer as well? Well, I, I've never really liked that concept, social investment, even though I like the what, what it brings about. I, I think our concept in the title of this conference, Resilience, is so much better. And talk about empowerment, user involvement, and resilience, how we increase resilience and decrease vulnerability is much like more a uh, respectful approach towards the individual. And I, again, I think we might want to add the children here because we we would like to see, I think Norway has done such a good job in, in promoting the Children's Rights Convention in, in regards to children's opinions. And I think we have a lot to learn from them and, and those who have taken that seriously. And now we see that, uh, what's her name, Greta, Mm -hmm. from Sweden is leading a, a social movement on her own and, and I, I think we should listen to these children more than we do today. That's a good point today. Yeah, so I, I, I agree with the uh, former speaker, so I'm not going to repeat what they said. Uh, but just to say that there are, there are certain groups in the Nordic countries that do not have autonomy. Uh, so. Uh, we invest in a lot of people and try to secure more autonomy, but sometimes we forget the relatives of people. So forgetting the relatives of people with handicap, people with diseases. Uh, so we are offering people carer leaves. So you are getting time off work to take care of your relative who are ill or who is a child or who may be in care of need for other reasons. But the carer, him or herself, do not get time off to restitute themselves. So we speed offers is something that we are not very good at in the uh, Nordic countries. We expect an increasing amount of uh, uh, impact from our civil society, but we are not uh, paralleling it with rights to uh, these people who are actually carrying out the caring. So I, I think that is a, a blind spot of the Nordic welfare model with regard to uh, autonomy, uh, and which does not fit a modern world where we are talking about dual earner couples and all these sort of things. Good point. Good point indeed. 
Yeah, may I just clarify the um, uh, possible, possible misunderstanding between Gudni and myself around the concept of social investment? I'd, I'd only refer to that concept because that's something that's typically occur in the, in the, in the literature. But um, I think what we're talking about here is recognition of uh, the diversity in needs, but also the uh, need to ensure the representation of marginalized uh, and socially excluded population groups in, in the, uh, not only the deliberation of the policies, but also in its uh, implementation in the local social services. Yeah, total agreement. Yeah. Good. Uh, we have one more question here from the audience, uh, a bit uh, to into a uh, different direction. Uh, what should be the role of the Nordic countries in developing EU social dimension? So far, the Nordics, ha Nordics have been against the EU social policy developments. Would you, you like to start? <laughs> <laughs> Do you agree with the questions? Yeah, I think, I think it's very funny. We have this uh, ambiguity that when we face the EU, we are proud of our model. And then we are afraid that if we start dealing with social policy in the EU, then our model will crumble, that we will sort of meet each other on a lower denominator. Uh, so far, nothing bad has happened. So uh, Denmark has been part of the EU since 1973, and I still think that we are part of the Nordic uh, welfare club, even though we may be an outlier. <laughs> um, so I think that, uh, yes, we should actually uh, be perhaps more active in uh, promoting uh, the Nordic welfare model and say what is uh, working and what is not working uh, in the model more openly to uh, the EU. And there seems to be a big interest uh, in it, uh, even though that, of course, they don't call it a Nordic model because you cannot sell a Nordic model to Greece or Italy or something like that. And, you know, then you use the words of social investments because that's what we're doing and, and that's more acceptable uh, in, in this context. So, uh, so yes, I think we should talk more about what we are doing uh, and, and not call it Nordic, but, you know, Call it something else. So call it what but it is. you are in favor of in favor of more active role of the Nordic countries when it comes to the EU social dimension. I think there are two ways to influence uh, policy making in the EU. One way, one way is of course to that 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 we are more active, as John Christ said. But another way, which we constantly influence EU decision making is when we produce all these uh, reports on, 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 on outcomes and policy. And we do this for Sweden, we do it for Denmark, uh, we do it for all the, the, the European countries. And of course, those reports do not go unnoticed. So, so obviously policymakers see that, well, the Nordic countries are always best in the class. So, so th that is also one way to to influence decision making, although it may not be as visible as having a politician talking loud to the parliament. Yeah, but yeah, so um, I have two examples uh, where the Nordic countries have uh, figured as examples to follow by. Uh, by, uh, by other EU members. First, the youth guarantee uh, has been uh, modeled from uh, Sweden, I think from, from Denmark, uh, that has been now adopted into the European, uh, uh, official European uh, level policies. And also, the, for instance, the recommendation on active inclusion from 2008 also uh, referred to Sweden as an example of a more active labor market policy. So you see from time to time how also the Commission is referring to, 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 to you know, various, various uh, Nordic countries. As for Norway, Norway is obviously not sitting around the table together with the EU28 member states. Um, nevertheless, and, and we are not a member or taking part in, in the European semester cycle, um, but nevertheless there are also some opportunities for, for Norwegian stakeholders to be involved, um, partly through uh, European level umbrella organisations that have various forms 
uh, various meetings points uh, um, and platforms for, for policy learning and policy exchange. And we also have on the academic side uh, networks such as the social policy expert group um, and similar uh, uh, organizations or, or mechanisms in place that provide opportunities to influence also on the social policies of, of the EU. Would you like to really something, add something to that? Not much to add, just I think we should use every opportunity. It's as simple as that. So you are all in favor of, of more active role of the Nordic countries, especially sort of promoting the Nordic model, which you will not call as a Nordic model among the EU people, <laughs> but as a social investment. But do you think, would there be something to learn from the other European countries, although Jon previously said that this is not like learning from the other countries, that the sort of the Nordic countries are good references and good places to, to uh, learn from each other. But uh, must ask that question, since you all spoke in that way when you talk about the EU policy. <laughs> I can start. I, I think Yusion was uh, pointing out this with family carers. I mean, we have a lot to learn from other countries in that respect. And not only European countries, but also uh, America. Uh, they have much better schemes and supports than we have. And, and in so many aspects, we could learn from others. So we should be humble at the okay. same time. Good. Then I will ask you a simple question. What, you, what would you import from some other country? Start with the Ken up there. Short. Something uh, too yellow. <laughs> yeah, import. Yeah, I don't know. Dutch uh, licorice, maybe? Uh, no, uh, yeah, well, I think I, I would import, um, um, well, it's, it's a tricky question, but, but I think that I would import uh, uh, better, better protection for uh, unemployed workers. Better protection for unemployed workers. Where Sweden nowadays definitely is not among the best in the class. Are you talking about the financial support or are you talking about the services? I'm talking about the financial support. To some extent also services because we still spend a lot of money on active labor market policy in Sweden. But that money has shifted into cheaper programs that basically doesn't lead to employment, whereas those programs that actually may lead to employment are also more costly and they're also basically abolished. Great. So I think uh, one area uh, where the Nordic countries have perhaps not been uh, on the lead, but where, but where in fact the European Commission and, uh, and the UK has have been more the front runners has been in the uh, adoption of non-discrimination regulations or uh, uh, non-discrimination uh, legislation. Um, so uh, back with the, the um, uh, adoption of the Maastricht Treaty, uh, the treaty provided the grants for, for the European Union to have more power or uh, legal competence in uh, in a non-discrimination uh, law, and um, and it has taken some time for for several of the Nordic countries to adopt similar non-discrimination legislation, both for 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 women and for minorities and so on. Sweden was quite um, early, or uh, the first among the, the Nordic countries. Um, Norway and Denmark and, and Iceland have responded uh, later and uh, partly has been more reluctant, I think, than, than Sweden was initially. So this is an area I think we actually have something to, to learn from from what's also going on in elsewhere in Europe. Okay, great. And how about you, Putin? From the Icelandic it's, perspective? Oh, it's, it's really hard to choose. Only one? Only one. Okay. To keep it short. Okay, to keep it short, I think I'm going to vote for the Spanish paid parental leave Spanish. if they get through the 50-50 division between mothers and fathers. Good. 
Yeah. So they're taking the lead. Can I work for the same? <laughs> <laughs> No, so uh, so the EU has indeed been an icebreaker, as uh, Rune was saying, in uh, discrimination issues, uh, gender, and perhaps also increasingly in other areas uh, where you can uh, discriminate. So so that that is good, and I think that the new parental leave scheme that we have just had uh, negotiated on the 29th of January, it was finished with the negotiations, is introducing five uh, uh, days for carers, uh, so they can take uh, days off for taking care of their children, their sick relatives, or their persons with handicap, or other relatives. I think that's a, a, a novelty in an EU social policy context that is bringing new life also into the Nordic countries. So, uh, so that was uh, uh, interesting. Um, more general policies, I would, I would uh, probably uh, look for policies in the other Nordic countries, I must say. Great, thank you. So must, I must ask this question. Now we have, talking about, have talked about the key characteristics of the Nordic model, what you think are sort of the core values, and do you actually think that we have a Nordic model? And you were all uh, agreeing that yes, we have a Nordic model, and we can still distinguish several characteristics. You, you saw some positive uh, development and some uh, negative development, we have shortly uh, touched upon the challenges. I picked up that both, uh, both Jon and, and um, um, Kenneth mentioned the uh, aging population, whereas uh, Gudni took up the uh, climate environment aspect and uh, uh, Rune took up uh, sort of the lost in trust and decline in uh, trade union uh, memberships. Would you like to add something to the list of challenges that the Nordic welfare states are facing uh, in near 10 years? Well, we, we, we need to be better uh, integrating uh, migrants into society. At least Sweden needs to be for much better there. Uh, we also need to develop ways to cope with, with populism in policy making, which very much is related to social policy. Uh, so, so those are major issues that we haven't talked about. So um, uh, another um, fact that also I think it represents potentially a um, uh, risk uh, for the Nordic countries is the uh, alleged digitization of working life and uh, digitalization of social services and um, also the emerging so-called gig, uh, gig economy with more persons employed in zero-hour zero contracts or as, as self-employed or uh, as uh, freelance consultants. Um, I think it's still uh, up the pipeline to what extent that actually is, we, can, we have statistics that support uh, or to, to, to evaluate how strong that tendency uh, or, or development trend is, but it's um, I think something that needs more attention in the future. I would try to stress my point about the climate because that will unfold so many challenges. And for example, we all have experienced the extreme weathers that have been hitting Nordic countries to a certain extent. And this mass migration that will follow the changes in weather and climate and all kinds of social disasters might are at least mapped when we look at the risk predictions so we believe that, uh, when I say we, we are a small group of scholars who have been discussing disasters and, and welfare states. We believe that we have so much to prepare for mm -hmm. that we haven't really addressed because we are kind of in our boxes talking about the policies and what we usually do. We do not discuss this uh, intersectionally 
and we do not discuss what we are doing with, for example, uh, emergency management. So we need to bring the dialogue further and we have to start to prepare for uh, quite different times than we are living right now. So I, I think we have a lot to do. Would that be an excellent theme for some coming conferences? Maybe. How well the Nordic countries are uh, responding to these questions. Jan, would you like to add something for the list of, of the challenges? I think they are all very uh, well placed, these challenges. So I think they are the major ones. And of course, we also have globalization as you know, increasing competitiveness uh, for more groups in society is one of them. Uh, I think that there, there are also uh, promises, you know, that technology is, is changing the labor market and the way that it works, but it may also give us new uh, tools uh, to uh, improve the services we deliver and the way we uh, deliver them. Uh, so, so I think that's also an important research field that is opening up for us. How can we use uh, technology? How can we use behavioral insights uh, from other fields than economics to help us inform policy making? Um, I think that, that there, are, there are some nice uh, possibilities for social researchers uh, and social policy to go into. Uh, Rune has written with his colleagues that bumblebee still flies, haven't you? We have, yes. <laughs> what do you think? And this is a question for the audience as well. You can take the poll. What do you think? Will the Nordic or will the bumblebee fly in the 2030s? Can I answer that? You can answer that. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, so 30 years ago, we were discussing whether it was the end of the Nordic welfare model. I think some of us talked about uh, the title by uh, Stefan Marklund, Paradise Lost, you know, that in 89, uh, you were seeing that we could no longer continue as we have. Uh, we are here today still talking about the Nordic welfare model, and I hope that we will also be here <laughs> in some years ago. Uh, Oli Kankas uh, once said it about the Swedish model, that no matter what happens to the Swedish model, you know, no matter how many cuts you make, it will still remain Swedish. <laughs> uh, so, of course, we will have a Nordic model, but I hope it will also be one that we can uh, uh, praise for some good uh, social outcomes. Thank you. I can take the, the environmental issue again because, we, as we know, we are, we are seeing fewer and fewer bees in general. So I would like to answer, it depends on how we behave if we have still a bumblebee in 2030. Just to add to this, um, in Norway, obviously, the uh, um, dependency on incomes from oil will uh, eventually decline or at least there's a awareness that we Nova needs to prepare for a different uh, economy that is less oil dependent so um, I think in line with what good news suggests it depends on how well um, the government and uh, other uh, uh, stakeholders respond to the new uh, challenges and are forward leading in finding a uh, proper balance between uh, uh, different types of uh, social policy measures, combining both uh, redistributive measures with more demand uh, side social regulation uh, of um, uh, of uh, access to the labor market and so on, and also involve citizens and citizens' groups in those decision-making processes to make sure that there is to, to foster uh, as much trust and, and so that, uh, uh, in the system and also solidarity uh, between population groups uh, as possible. Great. So we have one yes. Perhaps, perhaps, Kenneth. Will the bumble Should I say no fly? then? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the it's a, it's a tricky question because, as as Ole said and as John said, that Ole said, uh, of of course, 
you know, it, it will be there in one form or the other. The, the thing is that the, the, the welfare state we have in, in the Nordic countries today are very different from the welfare states we had in the 1980s. And, and there, there is no way we're going to go back to the 1980s and how it looked like then, because the, the world is different today. And, and the labor market is different, the aging population and all that. So certainly the welfare state we will have in, the, in, in, like in two decades ahead uh, will be different from the one we have today. And I have strong worries for the Swedish welfare state in terms of poverty and inequality and stuff like that. I, I think we're, we're, we haven't seen the end of, of, of uh, changing the Swedish welfare state in ways that, that definitely will increase poverty and inequality. I don't think, I think we, 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 we're gonna move closer to poverty rates and inequality rates that are uh, prevalent on the continent in Europe. That, that's my pessimistic uh, guess, yeah. Great. Okay, not too many votes. Um, 18 says yes, um, the bumblebee is still flying, and four votes for no. Well, I guess that this audience is quite positive. They think that the Nordic model is a super model and it, it will fly, meaning that it's really successful. It's uh, securing or maximizing the human capacity, as, as Jan was saying earlier, and still be uh, economically efficient. Okay, one of, of the purposes of this conference is, is that it serves as a kickoff for the Nordic welfare research network. The Nordic welfare uh, states have been studied for many decades, for many decades by the Nordic as well as the non-Nordic scholars. And uh, occasionally there have been networks that collabor uh, allows collaboration between the researchers. Uh, after the end of the Nordic Centers for Excellence, uh, the uh, Nordvel and reassess there has not been a platform uh, that would regularly bring together uh, those scholars interested in the Nordic welfare state. And we have now uh, discussed with uh, this group and with some other group of people that we should establish a Nordic Espanet network. Uh, what do you see? What are the benefits of this kind of network? What do we aim with the network. Can go ahead, you are already. I think it's, you know, the, the, the overall objective, I think, is quite simple, to, to, to make uh, Nordic research on social, social policy even better. That's why we engage, that's why we collaborate, that's why we share experiences and, and show our results and we want feedback on what we're doing. So, so that would be my, my sort of first answer. Uh, um, uh, and, and I also think that that objective is, is very important because social po for every year social policy as an academic subject is just growing bigger and bigger and bigger. And we see that, for example, during the ESPANET conferences, which are also growing bigger and bigger for every year, even though 50% of all the papers submitted to the conference are rejected. So, so, so it's not only the, the economy that, that is being globalized and increased the competitiveness, but also academia and research. And, and I think that in the Nordic countries, we ha have had a very strong uh, foothold in, in, in social policy uh, research. And, and I think that, that, that if we want to if we, if we want to be best in the league also in terms of doing social policy research, we, we, we need to collaborate. Uh, yeah. Good. Okay. So, um, I think for, for this kind of uh, network, it's uh, as uh, important that we collaborate as critical friends who so can help to improve each other's work, but also to, to stimulate perhaps more cross-country comparisons than um, is often the case, and uh, move from single country uh, case studies to two or three uh, or four country comparisons. And the um, Nordic countries uh, provide uh, opportunities 
to compare cases that are fairly uh, similar, and it makes sense still to compare the Nordic countries, um, despite our uh, uh, questions about whether they are drifting apart. Um, and I think also in 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 the EU system, we see that it's often not possible to include all the Nordic countries within this same uh, grant agreement, or when we're applying for money from the Horizon 2020, for instance, we are, it's not possible to, to include all the Nordic countries in, in, that, in those proposals, because we need to take the entire Europe into account. So I think this a Nordic Esplanade will provide opportunity to focus more exclusively perhaps on the Nordic uh, countries and the Nordicness of the of those of these countries um, and also to provide a platform for uh, developing new research projects together and perhaps also in dialogue and collaboration with countries outside of Europe for instance Asian countries or, or the, the US and Canada, it makes sense to compare perhaps with the Nordic countries as a cluster than just to focus on one single uh, Nordic country. Yeah, to add, uh, I mean, I was a part of RESS and we were cooperating a lot with Nordville and I really miss that dialogue. And obviously, since there are so many participants, I'm not the only one. So we, we need, there, there's a different dialogue if it's only us, the Nordic countries. It's somehow, we, we have a common platform and we can go directly to the subject. We don't need to present everything before we start discussing things. And even though we have a lot of Nordic cooperation and other conferences, I think we have this need for social policy conferences. And, and I, I really hope that we get this going. Jan, would you like to add something? Uh, I just wanted to add that um, I think that a lot of us have had our career started in places like this. Mm -hmm. As my own career started in Helsinki uh, many years ago, you know, maybe, maybe, maybe 28 years ago or something. And uh, we had met in Sweden to a social policy conference there. And then the Finns said, why don't we meet up in Finland and start a Nordic project? And we all said, yes, you know, why not? Uh, and then we were joking to each other and saying, oh, we, when are we going to the sauna? And the Finns said, oh, we're going to do that after the uh, meeting. <laughs> and, and, and that was sort of the, the standing joke the whole day. And in the evening, we were walking towards a restaurant, we thought, uh, and said, but what about the sauna? We're going to miss that. No, 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 that'll be where we're going to eat. And actually, the Finns took, took us to a sauna. <laughs> and that was a, a delegation led by Hanno Usitalo uh, and uh, Miku Kautu. I don't know if he's here still, uh, was there, and uh, Björn Minton was there. Uh, so uh, a lot of people who, who, lay, who became friends also, you know, were sort of uh, laying the basis of this uh, research network. Uh, I don't think we should start in the sauna anymore. <laughs> but, but I think that uh, having places where we can meet, meet and talk to each other is are really essential for improving the quality and for launching a new uh, project. So I think that's, that's a very good idea. Good. So we think it's good for the younger uh, researchers or younger scholars, good for high quality research, good place to, to meet your colleagues and get new ideas. Uh, we have a talk that we will organize a PhD course or workshop next year. And then there will be a conference like this in 2021. Keep posted. We will be sending you emails through the European Social Policy Analysis mail list. So, so. And of course, the, uh, well, at this point, let's give thanks to the panelists. Thank you.